Well, our series is talking about the Insta Christmas. Insta Christmas. It's referring to the fact that the Christmas story, in a moment, in an instant, people's lives were changed because they encountered the living God. You know, our lives, our lives, they're days and even moments that defined the rest of our lives. In other words, there's times in our lives, those moments in our lives that define the rest of our life. I remember a time that I was in seminary. I walked out of seminary class one day and there was a woman standing there and she had a sick pigeon wrapped up in her coat. And she looked at me and she said, would you help me take this pigeon to the veterinarian? And I thought she was wacky, but I said, yeah, I'll help you. I had no idea in that moment I was meeting the woman that I was going to spend the rest of my life with. <laughs> had no idea. But in that moment, I met my wife, Tammy. She saves everything, even <laughs> pigeons. And when I met her, in that moment, my life changed for the better. Took a totally different direction. We're looking at a story today in the scriptures that in a moment, a young Jewish girl, her life changes in a moment. It's found in, again, Luke chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 26 through 38. And there in the story, we're going to find that an angel shows up in, in a moment, instantly. He appears, and he has a miraculous message for the Virgin Mary. He's going to tell her that she's going to give birth to the Son of God. And in that moment, her entire life changes. That's why we're calling this the Holy Tweet. It's the name of the sermon, the Holy Tweet. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you and praise you for who you are. And we just ask today, I ask, that you'd forgive me and cleanse me of any sin. And that you would fill me with your spirit. That you would speak to your people. And we as your people wouldn't just be hearers of your word, but we would be doers of it. And you wouldn't just stir us, but that you would change us. For Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Verse, verses 26 through 28, they tell us or, or give us the context, and then they give us and introduce to us the characters of our story. Let's look, first of all, at the context. In other words, the time frame. Here it is in verse 26. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. The, ref the reference to Elizabeth's pregnancy is giving us the context, the time frame. Elizabeth was married to Zechariah. That's what it tells us in the first chapter. And Zechariah was a priest. He was part of the priesthood. And they'd been praying for years that they would have, chi have a child. But Elizabeth, her womb was barren. Barren. And now they've become too old. Too old. But in that moment to have children. But in that moment, Gabriel shows up. And he has a message for Zechariah. He tells Zechariah that God has had favor on him and his wife Elizabeth. And they were going to have a son. And we know who that son is or was. He's John the Baptist. But Zechariah had a very difficult time believing it because Elizabeth had been barren for years. And now they've become too old to have children. So he asked Gabriel, he said, Gabriel, show me a sign. Give me a sign because I'm doubting, I'm questioning. Well, because of his doubt, God gave him a sign, but the sign was that he couldn't speak until his son was born. That happened because of unbelief. You know the, the principle of that story? When an angelic being, when an angel shows up and he gives you a message, believe him, okay? Don't doubt. Well, God did exactly what he said he would do. And Elizabeth was pregnant. And it says in our, in our passage that she's six months inside the, pres uh, the pregnancy. In other words, she, she's six months. So that tells us from verse 25 to 26, there's a six-month period. That gives us the context. Now let's look at the characters in our passage. In verse 26, it says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Who's Elizabeth? Mary's cousin. So Mary has, without a doubt, an understanding, knows and understands that her cousin Elizabeth is pregnant. And her pregnancy is a miracle. And then the verse goes on in verse 26 and tells us that God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth in a town of Galilee. Why Nazareth? Because that's where Mary and Joseph 
were growing up. That was their hometown. And Gabriel, who's he? He's an angel. But he has a certain role. The role is that he was the messenger of God. He gave a message to Mary. He gives a message to Zechariah. You go in the Old Testament, he shows up and gives a message to Daniel. That was one of his roles, to be a messenger. But we need to remember, he's just the messenger. The message is from the living God himself. So he's carrying the message to these people and communicating. So in verse 27, it says this, To a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David, the virgin's name was Mary. So Joseph was a descendant of David, and he was pledged to be married to the virgin Mary. Now what's the word pledge mean? It's, it's the same word that we use today, engagement. In other words, they were not yet married. And this usually lasted one year. It was customary. They would be one year pledged, engaged. So during that time, Mary would be living with her parents. Joseph would be living with his. And they were waiting to be married. So here you have, you have the context. And now you have the characters in the story. So now let's look at the message. God's message to Mary. Let me break it down for us. When we look at this, first of all, it says that Mary, a virgin... You have to understand that most scholars believe that Mary was about 12 years old or she could have been 19, anywhere in between. So I'm going to pick 16, okay, just for our story today. She's 16 years old. So here you have Mary. She's 16. She's, she's a virgin. And she's pledged to be married to David. She's living in Nazareth, her hometown, with her mom and dad. And she's anticipating the moment that she's going to get married to Joseph. She's excited. She's anticipating this. Like every good prospective bride, she's thinking about it. She's working it out in her mind. She's thinking about the, the details and all that should take place. She's thinking about the guest list. She's thinking about the decorations, the food, the music that's going to play. She's thinking about what she's going to wear, what they're going to do with all the people when they show up, where they're going to stay. She's planning. She's anticipating. And it's right here in this moment that God shows up and says to this 16-year-old girl, I want you to give up your wedding dreams. I want you to give them up. And I want you to be part of something that is unbelievable. Something that is unthinkable. Something that is unimaginable. I'm going to ask you to believe me that I can do something that is impossible. Will seem to be impossible. And what God asked Mary to do not only changed her life, in other words, the direction of her life, but so changed her for all eternity. So let's look at that message. What was God's message to Mary? And what is God's message to us? Let's break it down. Verse 31. You will be with child and give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus. In the Hebrew, that means Yahweh saves. Can you say that with me? Yahweh saves. That means God saves. Now, in those days, it was common for a lot of people to be named Jesus. Just like today in our, in our country, a lot of people are called John and Bob. Well, a lot were called Jesus. So when, when Gabriel said, you're going to name this name Jesus, but all of a sudden, it took on a whole other meaning. Why? Because it's Gabriel who's saying this, right? An angelic being. It's miraculous. Now, I don't know how many of you have met up with Gabriel, but I, I've never met Gabriel. And Mary's standing there. Here's Gabriel. And he's saying, guess what, Mary? You're going to call this one Jesus. Yahweh saves. Now, she's a good Jewish girl. She knows about the Messiah. She's heard about the prophecies, about the coming of the Messiah. So things are clicking in her head. Oh, my word, I'm a virgin. He's saying, I'm going to name my son Jesus, this son, this one I'm going to bore. And I'm going to name him God saves. What's going on? Maybe this verse popped up in her mind. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 says this. Therefore, the Lord will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. And call him Emmanuel. Well, Gabriel clears it up real quick. He tells her clearly that she is going to give birth to the Messiah. Look what he says in verse 32. He will be great. And he will be called the son of the most high. When he says he's going to be the son of the most high, what he's saying is that this child is going to possess the very nature and essence of the living God. 
Let me say that again. The very nature and essence of the living God. In other words, he was going to be God. He was going to be God, the Son, and the Son of God. All in one. He was going to be the Messiah. The Messiah. And so that Gabriel, when he makes this statement, as he says this, he then starts right out by backing up what he said with prophecy. In other words, the reference he's going to refer to here is referencing a number of prophecies. Look what he says. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, verse 33, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. He's referring to a lot of prophecies. I don't have time to go into them, but I'm going to give you the most famous because this is probably the one that Mary would have known of. You ready? It's found in Isaiah chapter 9, and we're going to look at verses 6 and 7. I'm going to ask that you stand with me. You stand. Let's read this together. It's a great verse. It's reminding us of the prophecies of of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here it is in verse 6. For to us, read it with me, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Great job. You may be seated. Well, Mary might not have known all the details, but it was very clear that she was going to give birth to the Messiah. The Messiah. So how does Mary respond to this? Well, she responds in two ways. First, she asks a question, and then she gives an answer. Let's look at the question. In verse 34, it says this. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so that the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. What Gabriel was saying to Mary is this, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. He will superintend over your pregnancy so that the Son of God would not be born of man, but would be born of God. In other words, he would not be born from, the, from, the, from a man's seed. Like all of us, we are born of the seed of man, but he was to be born of God. That's important. I'll come back to that. And the word overshadow here means this. It's talking about the Holy Spirit superintending not only the conception, but the entire process. In other words, he was, the Gabriel was telling Mary, listen, the Holy Spirit's going to oversee the entire process of your pregnancy. He's going to protect, he's going to keep, he's going to sustain you and Jesus and Joseph and the whole ball of wax. He's going to cover it, protect it. The whole. Now we have the New Testament. We get to look back over the record and we see that the Holy Spirit supernaturally oversaw them during the entire process. Amen? Amen. And that's exactly what Gabriel tells her. So Gabriel's saying, your pregnancy is going to be a miracle. A miracle. And since Mary would have probably had some questions and probably would have had some doubts, Gabriel just keeps moving on, driving that truck through that whole thing. And he begins to refer back to Elizabeth. Look what he says in verse 36. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in your old age. And she she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. Remember, Elizabeth is Mary's cousin. So Mary totally understands that this pregnancy is a miracle. And what Gabriel is saying to Mary is this. Hey, Mary, you might doubt my words, but I'm referring to you back to Elizabeth. You know her pregnancy is a miracle. She was too old. She couldn't conceive. But if God can give her a child, if God can do this for her, can you not believe God that he can do This for you. And then he ends it with verse 37, which is probably the most powerful verse. You ready? Verse 37 says this, for nothing is impossible with God. Now that word nothing means exactly what it means. Nothing, absolutely nothing, nothing too hard, nothing too difficult for God. God is a God of miracles. Another way that you can translate this verse is this way. For no word from God will ever fail. 
No word from God will ever fail. Though that verse can be translated both ways. And you know why? Because what Gabriel is saying to Mary in the Hebrew is he's saying this. You know, Mary, that your God is a God of miracles. You know that. But he also is a God who cannot lie. And he is the faithful promiser. And if he tells you he's going to do something, he's going to do it. You can believe him. You can trust him because he is God, the God of miracles, and he's the faithful promiser. So how does Mary respond to this? Look what she says as she responds. You find the answers. First there was a question, her question was answered. Now she gives the answer. I am the Lord's servant, verse 38. My, Mary answered, may your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. What's amazing is that God asked her to believe what was impossible. And she said, yes. She said, yes. And because she said, yes, she was part of Christmas. She was part of it. And because she said, yes, the Messiah would, was born and she gave birth to him. She's no savior. She's just like you and I. She was not sinless. She was sinful like you and me, but God used this choice servant to give birth to the son. And because she was faithful, for she was faithful, and that God used her. She believed that God was a God of miracles. She believed that God was a faithful promiser, and God used her life. You know, that's true today. God can use you. God can use me. If we're willing to say yes. You know, Christmas, it doesn't matter where you look in the story, where you look in the narrative, there's miracles everywhere. I mean, miracles everywhere. I mean, there's two words that go together, Christmas and miracles. So if you look at the narrative, you're looking at the wise men, you're looking at the shepherds, you're looking at Joseph and Mary. What happens? They have an encounter with the living God and their lives are never the same. In a moment, in an instant, there they are and miraculous things are taking place and their lives are changed. So at Christmas time, especially, those, those words don't change. Christmas and miracles. And the God that we serve is the same God that Mary served. And he's still a God of miracles. And it's Christmas time. And some of you walked in this room today and you're carrying some really heavy burdens. And you've been praying, you've been asking God, God, please meet me. Give me a word, Lord. You know why? Because you've lost your job and you're out of a job. Some of you, your marriages, they're in trouble. You, some of you walked in here today and your kids have wandered away from God. Or you're strained in a relationship with your children or with your parents. Some of you are in here, in here today and you're facing the biggest and largest financial problem in your lifetime. Some of you are facing health issues that you, you were not counting on. But there they are. And they're staring at your loved one. They're staring at you. Some of you for the very first time in your life, you're going you're gonna to spend Christmas alone the one that you love, the one that you married, the one that has been part of your life is gone and you're alone. I don't know what all the needs are, but I'll guarantee you this, God does. And this God who's still a miracle, a still a miracle world worker is saying to us today, this is the word. The word is Christmas and miracles. That's what I can do if my people will trust and obey and they will say yes to me. I will do something that is miraculous in their lives. That's what he's saying. Amen. And it's true today as it was then. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you this. I've been studying the Bible for 30 plus years. And when I look in the Old Testament or New Testament, it doesn't, doesn't matter where you look. Every time there's a miracle, there's always a problem. So you know what that means? The only people who cannot experience a miracle. Let me say that again. The only people who cannot experience a miracle are people who don't have problems. So listen, if you have a problem in this room and you're willing to trust and obey like Mary did, you become a candidate for a miracle. Just like in Mary's life, 
You become a candidate. I don't care how bad your marriage is. I don't care how bad that relationship is. I don't care how bad it is in your life. If you're willing to step out with God and say, God, I surrender. God, you're mine. I'm yours. Take over in my life. And if you will be patient, if you will walk consistently with God, God will make a way where there seems to be no way in your life. If not, if, you, if that's not true, we all need to go home. He is a God who's in this room right here, right now. Quiet your soul. Listen to him. I'm just a messenger. God's speaking to you. He's saying, I see everything about you. I see when you're crying. I see when you're, you're mad. I see when you're frustrated. I see how you drive. <laughs> he sees it all. And he's saying, you're my son. You're my daughter. But you act like you're not mine. You try to live this life on your own all the time. I'm the last one you come to. And I could help you. If you'll say yes to me. When you look at the scriptures here now, you know, there, I also know this in this room. I know there are people in this room that are really questioning. And you're questioning, you're saying, but Pastor Ed, is really Jesus the Messiah? Let me help you with that. Because I know we live in a very skeptical world today. It's amazing. I, I'm encouraging you to shut down your media. I'm, I'm encouraging you to get off the television. That stuff that's going on, man, it is so unbelievable. Just, no, we are of another, of another world. We are of a different kingdom. But if you're wrapped up in that stuff, it doesn't matter what it is. I mean, seriously, I know I'm going off a little bit, but even ESPN, I used to be able to watch ESPN. Now they're critical. Like, who cares what you have to say about anybody or anything? Just tell me what happened last night in the football game. But they'll sit there and dissect everything and tell everything that was wrong. And it's like, does anybody have anything positive, anything good to say about anybody? So here we are. We live in, so skepticism comes in, even into our minds and hearts. So let me help you today. Seriously, look right here. You're sitting there going, Pastor Ed, is Jesus really the Messiah? Yes. Let me tell you one of the reasons why. You remember Mary? She was told a few prophecies. She believed God did a miracle. We have the privilege of having the Old Testament and the New Testament in our hands. We get to look at it all. In the Old Testament, do you know there are 331 prophecies in the Old Testament? I told you this before. 331 prophecies telling about the Messiah. And did you know that Jesus Christ fulfilled 100% entirely the 331 prophecies in his lifetime? Every one of them. Now you've got to remember, he was only around 33 years. But someone decided to look at the odds of that happening. And his name is St Stephen Stoner. He's a mathematician. He's in a college and he grabbed a bunch of people, his students, and they looked at the fact, they looked at the odds, I should say, of one person fulfilling eight of those 331 prophecies. And this is the number that they came up with. They said the odds of that happening in one person's life, in their lifetime, you got to remember, these prophecies were foretold thousands of years, hundreds of years before Jesus ever showed up on the scene. A number of those prophecies he couldn't control. And one person fulfilling eight of those prophecies, it means this. This is the number. One in ten to the 17th power. Can you say that? One in ten to the 17th power. What in the world does that mean? That's one with 17 zeros behind it. Now, so what? That's a big old number. Let me help you with that. You take all the people who have ever been born in the history of the world. You take that number and you multiply it a million times, millions of times over, you come up with that number. That's the chances of just one person in their lifetime just fulfilling eight 
problem. Then they went on. They looked at 48. Someone fulfilling 48 of those 331 prophecies, and they came up with this number. One with 157 zeros behind it. I can't even explain it. I have no idea what to tell you about that one, and neither did they. You know why? Because it's miraculous. Jesus Christ in his lifetime fulfilled every one. You know why he did that? So we would have no questions. So we would know. He's the Messiah. So that doesn't save you and me. We can say, yep, he's the Messiah. But this is what he said about himself. You see, sooner or later, you've got to say yes or no. And he finally says this. This is what he said about himself in that day and says it to us. I love this. Look at this. John chapter 14, 16. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. What's he saying? I tell you the truth. I tell you the truth. I am the way to eternal life. life. See, in those days, they were looking for a political Messiah, one that was going to deliver them from the Romans. He was saying, no, 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 that's later on. I'm coming now because you're lost. You're in sin. And if I don't do this for you, if I don't make a way for you, you're going to be lost forever. I'm having, making sure that you're part of the kingdom of God, not the kingdom of this world. And they didn't understand that. That he was trying to save us because you and I break God's laws and we'd be lost forever. So Jesus was coming to be our Savior, to rescue us. Then it says in John 3, 16, For God so loved you, he said, that he gave his only Son, referring to himself. He said, anyone who believes upon him, Jesus, they shall be what? Should be forgiven, right? They shall, never, they shall not perish, but have what? Eternal life. He kept talking about eternal life. You know why? Because we were dead in our sins. And if we died in our sins, we were lost forever. But now he was making a way so that we could know that we have eternal life with God. Bringing us back into a right relationship with the Father. Why? Because Adam fell a long time ago. And when Adam fell, sin entered into the world and it contaminated every one of us. And that leads me to this. Some of you are in here saying, why a virgin? Why would it be so important that Jesus die of a virgin? Let me answer that very quickly. Because of the first Adam. The first Adam sinned. And when he sinned, everybody from him on, going on, was born into sin. We were born from the very seed of man. So everybody traces their roots right back to Adam. And every one of us have been born with a sinful nature. Say it with me. We have all been born with a sinful nature. In other words, we're prone to sin. And if you don't believe that, walk up to any parent in this room and they will tell you, you know, when I had my kid, I didn't have to teach them how to do wrong. They came to that naturally. Every one of them. And what I had to do is I had to teach them to do right. And that's true about everyone in this room. Everyone, you know why? Because we're all born of Adam. But then there's the second Adam. The second Adam is Jesus. The first Adam screwed up. He was sinful. Jesus is not born like you and I. He was not born in, with the seed of man. He was not born from Adam. He was born of God. And because he was born of God, he was not born with a sinful nature like you and I. And he lived a life that was perfect without sin. And because he lived without sinning, he could go to a cross who knew no sin for those of us who have sinned. He became the perfect sacrifice for those of us who have sinned because he came to undo what the first Adam had done. He was taking us back to the garden so we could start all over again. He was the new Adam. He was making it true so that you and I could be new again. So that we could be forgiven so when Jesus Christ died on that cross, he said it was finished. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. That's what the Bible says. Someone's going to die. Who's going to die? You and I die, we're lost. He dies. Who knew no sin? He became the perfect sacrifice. He could take and absorb the sin of the world upon himself, become this perfect sacrifice, and he says it's finished. What's finished? Your debt and mine. He paid it in full. The wages of sin is death. death. He dies. Not you. Not me. We don't pay for that. Because we were already in sin. But he's the perfect sacrifice. He pays for it. But he said when it said it's finished, he didn't say, I'm finished. He said, it's finished. He paid for it. You know what he meant by that? 
He's saying, I'm not done yet. He goes to the grave. When he goes to the grave, he walks out of the grave. And when he walks out of that grave, you know what he did? He not only overcame your sin, he overcame death. And because he lives, he is the only one who has the power and the authority to forgive you of your sin and to give to you what? Eternal life. That's right. He's it. And this is what's great about Christmas. Christmas and miracles. That miracle can take place in your life right here and right now. You can know that you're forgiven. You can know that you're not just a creation of God's, but you can become a child of God if you're willing to say yes to Jesus. If you're willing to say, Lord, all right, I surrender myself. I'm giving my life to you. I'm going to follow you. You know, you might have been in church all your life. You might be reading the Bible, but you've never done this publicly. You've never ever really admitted. You've never asked Jesus Christ to be your Savior and Lord. Let me tell you this. In the scriptures, it says this. He's, it says that he, if you're ashamed of me, he's going to have to be ashamed of you. There's no such thing as a private faith, anybody. That is not what the Bible says. You're either public, you're real, or you're not. So if that, you've never done this. You're saying, Pastor Ed, man, I want to end this thing right here and now. I need a miracle inside and out. And I want to yield. I want to surrender myself right here and right now. Man, I'm ending this thing. I'm, ask, I'm all in. If that's you, I'm just going to ask you to pray with me. It's going to be a real simple prayer. The prayer doesn't save you. Jesus does. But I'm just going to guide you in the conversation. And if you pray with this, pray with me. I'm going to ask that you just raise your hand at the end. And I'm going to pray over you. If you'd like this, you pray with me. Heavenly Father, we come to you. I come to you. And I ask you to forgive me of my sin. I've done things that I wish I would have never done. And I've been living my life my way. And I'm turning around. I'm following you. I'm coming to you, Jesus. I'm asking you to be my Savior and my Lord. Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of the things I've done wrong. And fill me with your spirit that I will live for you. I will follow you. That you'll do a miracle in my life. That you will fill me right now with your spirit. And I will walk with you from this day on. Help me to keep coming to this church where I can grow. Where I can learn about this real deep, intimate relationship with you. Set me free. Deliver me. Lord my God, my Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. You prayed that prayer with me. Just raise your hand. Very good. Many of you. Thank you. What I love about that is you're raising your hand. Look, at, look, look right up like that. You know what? God sees you. He sees every one of you raising your hand. And I'll guarantee you this. Heaven is going crazy. You know why? Because you really have just entered into the family of God. You are no longer a creation. You are a child of the living God. Begin to pray. Begin to ask God to help you. And as you walk with him.